Hi everyone, my name is FlygonHG, and this is the video of my attempts at a Pokemon White 2 Hardcore Nuzlocke using only Fire-type Pokemon. To see what I define as Hardcore Nuzlocke rules, check out the comments below. But in short, no items in battle, no overleveling past the gym leader's days, and we're playing on set mode. Okay, let's talk about the Fire-type Pokemon that we'll be using in this run. Fire is a pretty unique typing, because Fire-type Pokemon tend to be very powerful, but trend towards being a bit frail. Which means that if you can one-shot your enemy, things are fine. But if you can't, well then you're in a bit of trouble. Fire-types hit a lot of types for super effective or neutral damage, but they're also weak to ground, rock, and water types, which are all very common. Fire-types also tend to be pretty rare. Pokemon Diamond and Pearl are notorious for only having two Fire-types in the entire main part of the game. So it means that most games are actually pretty tough to solo with only fire types because there's so few of them. Fortunately, Black 2 and White 2 have a decent number of fire types. Here's all the fire types in the Unova Pokedex. But before you get too excited, we need to cut this down just a bit. Magmar is exclusive to Black 2, while Camerupt is exclusive to White 2. I went with White 2 because Magmar is in the same location as Growlithe, so in Black 2 we'd have one less encounter per Nuzlocke rules. Rotom Heat and Heatmore aren't accessible until after the Elite Four, not that I'm really complaining too much about not being able to use Heatmore. And lastly, I don't play with Legendaries, so no Victini, no Reshiram. That leaves us with 9 evolution lines, 5 of which are pure fire types, and all of which have a weakness to water types, which happens to be the 8th gym leader's preferred type. So this is going to be pretty tough. Let's see how it goes. Quick reminder before we start, I play with Species Claws, so I'll be able to reroll encounters until I get a unique encounter, but I can only use one of each unique evolution line. Okay, let's do this. I start the game by picking the fire type starter Tepig. I name him Zuko. Zuko has a hasty nature, which is a fine nature, plus speed at the expense of minus defense. Surely that won't really matter. Zuko and I immediately take on our rival Ransom. We slap him down with some tackles and head out. Not soon after that, we have to fight Ransom again. His Oshawa got a bit stronger, but Zuko hits a crit and takes it out with two shots before it does any real damage. Thankfully, this is the last rival fight for a long time which is a wonderful change from Black and White that has upwards of a dozen rival fights throughout the storyline of those games. Anyways, there's actually no other Fire-type encounters before the first gym, so it's just Zuko vs. the world right now. And this fight is simultaneously the most intense and the most boring fight that I've ever had, because we primarily just use Tackle over and over again. We tackle Charon's Patrat until it's down. Lillipup comes out, and we start doing damage with Tackle as Charon uses Workup to increase his attack. After that, Lillipup hits pretty hard, but our Orenberry prevents us from being in range of a KO. I switch to Ember here because I anticipate that another tackle will put me in range of Blaze activating, which will juice up my fire type moves and that should get me enough power to win. But Lillipup uses Work Up, so Blaze doesn't activate and Ember leaves him with a sliver. Now that I'm looking at it again, I'm pretty sure a tackle would have just taken him out. At this point, I assume it's completely over, but somehow Zuko survives with 1 HP and retaliates with Ember for the win. What an absolute animal. Bravo, Zuko. By just the absolute thinnest of margins, we get badge number one. Before taking on the second gym leader, we get another encounter at Verbank Complex. I catch a Growlithe and name him Johnny. Frustratingly, Johnny has the ability Flash Fire instead of Intimidate, which is one of the best abilities in the game, since it lowers the opponent's attack when you switch in. Flash Fire, on the other hand, is ultimately completely useless. Growlithe is also pretty weak, so Johnny won't be useful until I can evolve him into an Arcanine, which won't happen for quite some time. So for now, he's moral support. With some training, Zuko evolves into Pignite, and he gains a nice fighting type, so that we have at least one Pokemon that's neutral to rock moves. With his newfound power, and the ability to stand on two feet, we take on the second gym leader, Roxy. Charon was nice enough to give us the TM for workup after we crushed him without breaking a sweat. Seriously, easiest battle ever. Oh, and as a side note, TMs are now reusable in this generation, so I can freely teach many Pokemon the same TM. This is pretty awesome, because it gives you a lot more options when it comes to building teams and movesets for specific threats. Anyways, Zuko uses Workup twice on Roxy's Coughing to buff up his attack stat, and then a few flame charges takes out the Coughing, and also one-shots her ace, Whirlipede, and that wins us the second gym badge. Next up, we do... this. Just an absolute waste of time. Whoever pitched this should be fired from Game Freak and shunned from the video game industry for the rest of their sad, miserable excuse for an existence. Just... <sighs> Anyways. Before going to the third gym though, I get two new encounters. 
On Route 4, I catch a Darumako and name him Mako. Mako has a timid nature, plus speed, minus attack, which is pretty inconvenient since Darumaka, and more importantly its evolution, Darmanitan, are incredibly strong physical attackers. But I guess the plus speed is pretty nice. Right now, Mako has the ability Hustle, which ups attack, but lowers accuracy. It's an insanely unreliable ability, especially for Nuzlocking, so until he evolves into Darmanitan and gets the ability Sheer Force, he's moral support. We also head into the heart of Castelia City to catch a wild Eevee, but while we do that, we run into a Rattata, who's too fast for Johnny to escape from and brings Johnny to a sliver with a Hyper Fang. I could try to run again, but if I fail, I'm dead. And I could try to switch to Zuko, but if Rattata uses Pursuit, then I'm also dead. I decide to ultimately gamble with the switch, and thankfully it works out, but that was pretty scary. After that, I eventually find an Eevee, and I catch him. Fittingly, I name him Aang. You know, because he's the master of all the elements. It's clever, trust me. Aang has a bold nature, which is plus defense, minus attack. Again, not a great nature since Flareon has an amazing attack stat. So it goes. These new encounters are pretty meaningless at this point though, because once we get to the third gym, Zuko sweeps through Berg's Bug-type Pokemon pretty cleanly after two workups. Turns out that having an ace that is four times weak to fire types when I'm doing a fire type mono challenge makes it a pretty easy victory. With the third gym complete, I get access to my first Firestone, which I immediately use on Aang to get Flareon. Johnny will have to wait from the sidelines for a while longer. Now that Aang is no longer an Eevee, it's time to Eevee train him. Let me explain that joke for those of you who are confused by my comedic genius. See, Eevee is the name of a Pokemon, but Eevee training is short for effort value training, which is the process of training your Pokemon against specific enemies so that you add effort values to the appropriate stats. Here, I'm fighting Purloin, which give me speed EVs, and Patrat, which give me attack EVs. This way, Flareon will be faster, and it'll hit harder. Before we take on the fourth gym leader in Nambasa City, I head to Lost Lorn Forest to pick up a Panseer. This takes forever, since Panseer has a 10% chance of appearing in a shaking grass spot, which is already not that common. If it wasn't for emulator speedup, I would probably never do this. But Panseer will be pretty important in the near future, so this is necessary. I name him Pyro. Pyro has a timid nature, which is fine, actually it's great, since he'll be used mainly for his speed anyways, but more on that later. Now it's time for Elisa and her electric types. The plan is to take advantage of the fact that Aang can use Dig, but that actually ends up making very little difference. Elisa leads a Molga, who Volt switches into Flaffy, which gets hit by a Fire Fang. Static causes paralysis, but I've prepared for this with a Cherry Berry. A Dig takes out Flaffy, and then a Molga comes back in. Another Volt Switch brings Zebstrika out, who gets hit by another Fire Fang. A second Fire Fang takes out Zebstrika, and then Emolga comes out. Again. I'm worried about a crit, so I switch to Zuko. Emolga actually does get a crit on the second Volt Switch as I hit it with a Flame Charge. I'm pretty sure I'll outspeed thanks to the speed boost from Flame Charge, so I go for a second Flame Charge. But Elisa uses a Hyper Potion, and then I get paralyzed from Static. So now I'm definitely not faster, and I have to risk a crit. I decide to risk the crit with Aang instead of Zuko, but it turns out that a crit actually wouldn't have even killed him, so that was a mistake on my part and I definitely should have just stayed in with him in the first place. A final quick attack gives us a pretty sloppy win, and that's badge number 4. Up next is Clay and his terrifying Exedrill, but before I can even get to Drifil City, I have to take on this guy Charles in a triple battle with an Archon, a Sigilyph, and a Tortuga, all of which are big problems for my Fire-type Pokémon. Fortunately, the fact that I'm overleveled, and some pretty poor move choices from Charles, makes this one go relatively smoothly. But there's a handful of these triple and rotational battles in this gen that can really wreck you if you're not prepared for them. With that out of the way, I face what is, in my opinion, this run's first major challenge. The fifth gym leader, Clay. Let's take a look at his team. A Crocoroak, a Sand Slash, and an Exadrill. All of these Pokemon deal super effective damage to my entire team and Exadrill is able to one-shot every one of them with a non-critical hit Bulldoze. So I need to be able to outspeed and one-shot Exadrill before it hits me. If I can set up with Zuko or Aang, a Flame Charge or a Fire Fang, respectively, will be enough to one-shot him. Unfortunately, setting up is tough, because his other teammates can do a lot of damage with Bulldozes on their own, and that will lower my speed, which means I won't be able to outspeed Exadrill. So the question is, how do we set up? The solution comes in the form of a monkey with a turd emoji on his face. Pyro can learn Yawn, which will put the Krokorok to sleep 
allowing me to set up with Zuko and then sweep through Clay's team. I can also give Zuko an air balloon, which makes him immune to ground moves until he takes damage from another attack. This will allow me to survive long enough to get to Exedril. It's not a flawless plan, but it's the best one that I've got. But in order for this to work, Pyro needs to evolve into Simiseer. And for that to happen, I need another Firestone, which means I have to randomly find a Firestone in a Dust Cloud in Charged Stone Cave. According to Bulbapedia, every Dust Cloud has a 40% chance of being a Pokemon encounter, a 50% chance to be a gem, and a 10% chance to be one of 11 different evolution stones. If my math is right, that means that there's less than a 1% chance of finding a Firestone in each Dust Cloud. This takes so long. In order to do this efficiently, I buy a bunch of Super Repels, and I just ride back and forth until a Dust Cloud appears, and I do that over and over and over again. I burn through roughly 150 Super Repels before I find a Firestone. But eventually I do, and I get that sweet, sweet Simiseer. An extra benefit of this whole endeavor is that now I have a ton of gems, which can be used to power up a move of a certain type once by a whopping 50%. These are going to be really good later in the game. So now that Pyro is a Simiseer, it's Clay time. Clay leads Crocoroke, and I use Yawn as it hits a Bulldoze. Thankfully it doesn't crit, and then a Citrus Berry brings me back to over half health so that Crocoroke is forced to use another Bulldoze. I switch Zuko in on that next Bulldoze, which he dodges thanks to his Air Balloon. Crocoroke falls asleep, and now it's time to set up. My calculations tell me that I need two workups to successfully two-shot the Sand Slash that will come in next. Unfortunately, Crocoroke wakes up after just one turn of sleep, so he hits me with a crunch, which pops my air balloon. It's a bit inconvenient, but not a huge deal, since I know that I can survive one bulldoze from Sand Slash. So I knock out Crocoroke with a flame charge, and then out comes Sand Slash. Flame charge leaves Sand Slash with a sliver, but again, that's okay, because I can survive a bulldoze. Yep, that checks out. Gotta love critical hits. Well, this sucks. Not only did I just lose my starter, I lost one of the few dual-typed Pokemon that I had access to. Now my entire team is completely weak to ground, water, and rock. Really not what you want to see. I bring in Aang who knocks out the Sand Slash with two Fire Fangs as Clay goes for a Hyper Potion. Last is Exedril, but thankfully Aang is faster and thankfully hits a Fire Fang for the win. You might be wondering why I didn't just set up with Aang by using Workup, and sure, retrospectively, it would have probably saved me a Pokemon because a plus two Fire Fang would absolutely one-shot the Sand Slash. But Fire Fang is a 95% accurate move, so if I miss a Fire Fang on Sand Slash or Exadrill, then I probably lose the battle. And hitting both Fire Fangs is actually marginally less likely than not getting crit. So I went with probability, and ultimately I got screwed, but that's Pokemon for you. After burying our sweet, sweet Prince Zuko, I decide that playtime is over and I grind up Mako until he evolves into Darmanitan, who is an absolute monster. I also get access to the Relic Passage, which means I can get to the bottom of Relic Castle, and there I can catch a Volcarona, an immensely powerful fire bug type Pokemon that normally evolves from its base form at level 70. This is nothing short of a gift from God. Well, sort of. Volcarona is really powerful, but she learns pretty atrocious moves until around level 50. This can be somewhat alleviated with Move Tutor and TMs, but her true potential will have to wait until we get to higher levels. I name her Azula. Azula has a calm nature, which is finally a good nature since it boosts special defense and lowers attack, which is useless on Azula anyways since she's a special attacker. Now my team is starting to look a bit more formidable. And then there's Johnny. We have to take on the Pokemon World Tour before continuing, but because Mako is now a Darmanitan and is pretty overleveled, I walk through this tournament without any real problems. Like I said, playtime is over. After clearing through Charged Stone Cave, I end up in the Celestial Tower. Here I catch a Litwick, and I name him Ozai. Litwick evolves into Chandelure, which is a poorly designed but incredibly powerful special attacker. Unfortunately, the trend of garbage natures continues, with Ozai having an adamant nature which gives plus attack and minus special attack. That is literally the worst nature that we could have gotten. But it's fine, it's fine. I will EV train her in special attack and speed to compensate for it. I also make sure to EV train Azula in special attack and speed. And intermittently, I also train Johnny and Mako in attack and speed, and Pyro also gets max speed for quick yawns. While I'm getting everyone up to our new level cap, I actually find a shiny Audino, and I kill it, uh, eventually. The 6th gym leader Skyla is up next, but other than her Swana, she's pretty easy. After a single workup from Mako, Swoobat goes down to a Fire Punch, 
and then Swana comes out, but it goes down to a return boosted by a normal gem. Skarmory is last and hangs on from a fire punch thanks to its sturdy ability. Pokemon with the sturdy ability will actually be pretty inconvenient in later battles, but Skarmory can't do much to us, so it's not a problem here. I play it overly safe here and switch to Flareon, who takes it out with a quick attack before Skarmory can retaliate. That gets us badge number 6. Next up, there's a long stretch in these games between Gym 6 and 7, and during this time, we get some new team members. I catch a new mole in Reversal Mountain and name him Iroh. He has an impish nature, plus defense, minus special attack, which is fine I guess. But more notably, he has Oblivious as an ability, which turns into magma armor when he evolves, which is yet again the worst of the two abilities that Camerupt can have. But still, he replaces Pyro as my new Yawn user, and Pyro retires to the PC, at least for now. I decide to EV train Iroh in defense to make him a physical tank, which my team desperately needs. The next part of the game is pretty tough, so I make sure to get my entire team into tip-top shape. Ozai evolves into Lampent, and after delaying Iroh's evolution so that he can get early Earthquake, he evolves into Camerupt. Then, once I get a Dusk Stone, Ozai evolves into Chandelure. And finally, after getting Johnny to level 43, where he learns Outrage, I use the new Fire Stone that I picked up in Lentimos Town to evolve him into an Arcanine. At this point, we've gone a while without any major difficulties, but that changes when our rival Ransom surprises me with a battle in Undula Town. This happens in almost every one of my challenge runs. I almost always just forget about at least one rival battle. Anyways, Ransom leads with Unpheasant, and I have Azula out front, because of course I do. So I switch to Iroh to try and yawn the Unpheasant, but it uses Taunt, so I can't. I cycle out to shake off the Taunt and hit a yawn next time. Then I switch to Mako and set up two workups on the Sleeping Chicken. Then it's a Fire Punch to knock it out, and out comes Samurott. Return just barely doesn't kill Samurott. Gotta love that minus attack nature, right? And then he retaliates with revenge. This is really scary, because Samurott is now in torrent range, and has access to a priority Aqua Jet. On the next turn, Hugh uses a Hyper Potion, which was definitely an opportunity to get another work up in. Instead, I just bring him back down to red health. I switch out to Aang, who gets hit by an Aqua Jet that brings him all the way down to just 16 health. Fortunately, a quick attack takes out Samurott, and then a signal beam from Azula takes out the Simisage in the back, getting us a very sloppy victory. A critical hit from that Aqua Jet would have been completely devastating. Water types are just really hard for us to handle, which really doesn't bode well for the 8th Gym Leader. But before we do that, we have to take on the 7th Gym Leader, Drayden, and he uses Dragon types. But finally, after warming the bench for so long, it's time for Johnny to have his glorious day in the sun. Drayden leads with Drudagon, and I lead with Iroh, who as usual starts by using Yawn. Earthquake brings the Drudagon down to red health, which is actually a bit inconvenient because it means that Drayden will likely heal him on the next turn. He does do that as I switch to Johnny. A few crunches take out Drudagon as he thankfully stays asleep. Next is my favorite Pokemon, Flygon, but he goes down to a single outrage thanks to giving Johnny an expert belt, which boosts the power of super effective moves by 20%. Last is the always terrifying Dragon Dancing Haxorus, but he too goes down to a single Outrage. This gym is usually one of the hardest parts of the game, because Haxorus can very easily get out of control, and not very many things can take it out in one shot. So whoever gave Growlithe Outrage as a level up move, thank you. Unless you're the same guy that made me do Pokestar Studios. You sadist. Anyways. With the 7th Gym Badge 1, we get to experience this cinematic treat that has Martin Scorsese trembling in his little tiny boots. I mean, I kid, but the story in this game is actually pretty cool when compared to the very low bar set by previous Pokemon storylines. After some forgettable Team Plasma fights, it's a straight shot to the final gym, Marlin and his water types. This is the battle that I've been dreading since the start of this challenge. As we saw from our rival Samurott, any water type Pokemon that isn't one shot will do really devastating damage to our entire team, even without a critical hit. I mean, just look at this battle against one of Marlin's random gym trainers. This float cell outspeeds Ozai and almost one-shots him with Aqua Tail. If that was a crit, I would have lost Ozai, and probably this run. These water types are so difficult to handle. Marlin's team has an additional wrinkle in the form of his lead Pokemon, a Caracosta. This wouldn't necessarily be a huge issue, since Caracosta is four times weak to grass types, and Ozai has access to Energy Ball. However, this Caracosta has Sturdy, which prevents it from being one-shot, and it also knows Shell Smash. 
which is a very good setup move that doubles your speed, attack, and special attack at the expense of your defense and special defense. Simply put, this thing is terrifying and very difficult to set up on. Yet again, I came up with a solution that uses the turd monkey. But this time, he's going to pay the ultimate price. That's right, the only way that I can see to win this battle is sacrificing Pyro. Marlin leads the aforementioned Karakosta, and Pyro comes out. He yawns the Karakosta, who sets up a Shell Smash. I set up Sunny Day on the next turn so that Ozai can survive a hit from Wailord Scald. Karakosta hits Pyro with a Scald, which leaves him with just a sliver as he falls asleep. I'm not gonna lie, that's a little inconvenient. I thought that he'd knock out Pyro here with a Smackdown, which would trigger Pyro's Rocky Helmet to break sturdy, and then give me a free switch into Ozai. But I guess not. Now what I have to do is risk Karakosta waking up after just a single turn of sleep. I switch in Ozai and hit an energy ball. Thankfully, Karakosta stays asleep and gets knocked out after a few more turns. Unfortunately, because Marlin wasted a turn with a Hyper Potion, the sun is gone, which means I'm susceptible to being killed by a critical hit from the Wailord that comes in. So here, I decide to sack Pyro to get a clean switch into Aang to set up another sunny day. But when I switch in, Wailord uses Amnesia. Pyro lives for at least one more turn. But surely he dies on this next turn, right? So I set up a sunny day, and Wailord goes for a bounce. For some reason, Marlin really doesn't want to kill this monkey. So on the next turn, I switch in Chandelure to take the bounce, and then start hitting energy balls. They don't really do that much thanks to Wailord spamming Amnesia, so I decide to get chip damage in with Will-O-Wisp. But I completely forget that Wailord has Water Veil as an ability, which prevents burns. That could be a game-throwing play, but I do see my out. I switch to Mako, who takes a Scald as the sunlight fades. A Fighting Gem boosted superpower knocks out the Wailord, and then out comes Marlin's ace, the Jellicent. And finally, after surviving three separate attempts to sack him, I switch in Pyro one last time. He gets knocked out by a Scald, which gives me a safe switch into Ozai, who knocks out Jellicent with a Ghost Gem boosted Shadow Ball, winning us the match. That did not go remotely how I planned, but the net result was the same. An 8th gym badge obtained, and a dead pyro. Rest in peace, little dude. Say hi to Zuko for me. Before the Elite Four, we gotta wrap up the story. We get our second trip to the cinema, and then there's a bunch of Team Plasma fights. The only one that's really noteworthy and truly challenging is the fight against Getsis, especially because you have to fight Kyrim White right before that, and you get no break in between. So whatever you lead with in the fight against Kyrim White is also your lead against Getsis. It makes for a pretty unique challenge. I decide to lead with Azula, who sets up a light screen to reduce Kiram's very powerful special attacks. I then switch to Iroh, who shrugs off a fusion flare, and uses Yawn. Last is a switch to Mako, who takes out Kiram with a fire punch, followed by a superpower. Getsis gets pretty annoyed that his plan doesn't work, so he lashes out at me, a 10 year old. He leads Kofagrigius, and I again lead Azula, who has been magically healed back to full health. I set up a light screen as Kofagrigius uses Toxic. Then, I switch to Iroh, who, as I'm sure you've guessed, uses Yawn. On the next turn, I switch to Mako as Kofagrigius falls asleep. Next, I use Belly Drum, which halves my health but maxes out my attack stat. Truly an insane move to give to a Darmanitan. After that, it's Sweep City. Kofagrigius goes down to a Fire Punch, Seismitoad goes down to a Return, Drapion goes down to a Fire Punch, Hydreigon goes down to a Return, and Electros goes down to a return. Last is Toxicroak. Toxicroak actually knows Sucker Punch, which has priority, so a critical hit Sucker Punch might be able to kill me. So I switch to Ozai. He didn't actually go for Sucker Punch, instead he goes for Poison Jab, which hilariously burns him thanks to Ozai's Flame Body. I was actually going to do that with Will-O-Wisp on the next turn, but I guess this saves me a turn. I switch to Arcanine, who knocks out Toxicroak with a Fire Gem boosted Flamethrower, winning us the battle. After that, Getsis gives up and he and N go to father-son therapy or something, and I'm allowed to move on with my life. N also gives me the HM for Waterfall, which allows me to get one final encounter before the Elite Four, a Vulpix from the Abundant Shrine. This isn't super necessary, but I decide to go for it anyways. Ironically, on the way, Aang accidentally overlevels past the level cap, so I'm not allowed to use him for the Elite Four. That ends up being okay though, because as strong as Aang is, Flareon's move pool really limits how useful of a physical attacker he can be. For example, Fire Fang is his strongest physical fire move, so it's not the worst thing in the world that we have to leave him in the box. In any case, now I actually have room for the Vulpix on my team. I name her Korra. Korra has a bold nature. 
plus defense, minus attack, which is actually a great nature. With my new Vulpix, I carefully maneuver my way through Victory Road, making sure to only fight the trainers that I absolutely have to fight. There's some very challenging trainers in Victory Road, so I'm not taking any risks that I don't have to. The final challenge before getting to the steps of the Elite Four is a final fight with our rival, Ransom. I yawn his Unpheasant with Iroh and switch to Mako to set up Belly Drum, but I get hit with a Swagger, which could be trouble, so I switch back to Iroh and wait for the Unpheasant to wake up before using Yawn again. Another switch in lets me set up a Belly Drum, and then it's all over. Samurott doesn't even have Aqua Jet anymore, so there's nothing Ransom can do to stop Mako from plowing through his entire team. As a reward, he gives me the TM for Thunderbolt, which is completely useless to me. And with that, I head to the Elite Four. The final bit of training involves EV training Korra in Special Attack and Speed, as well as doing another Dust Cloud Hunt for a Firestone. This one doesn't take nearly as long though, so once Korra evolves into Ninetales and everyone is leveled up to the level cap of 58, it's time to take on the Elite Four. Here's our final stats going in. As you can see, we're a team of heavy hitters, but defensively, a lot of my Pokemon leave a lot to be desired. Let's see if we've got what it takes. The first battle is against Chantal and her ghost types. However, this is just a clean sweep with Fire Lord Ozai, who one-shots all of her Pokemon with Expert Belt boosted Shadow Balls. The other thing to note here though is that I gave Azula an experience share, so that she can level up to level 59 where she learns Quiver Dance, an incredible setup move that boosts special attack, special defense, and speed. We will immediately start to abuse this move in the next Elite Four fights. Also, I should point out here that my rule set states that my level cap is in effect until the start of the gym battle, or the start of the Elite Four challenge. Once the first battle starts, the next level cap goes into effect. That's why sometimes I'll edge my Pokemon close to the next level so that they can level up during the gym battle, which is sometimes just the extra bump that you need to win. Anyways, Grimsley and his dark types are up next. I lead Iroh, who gets hit with a fake out from Grimsley's Liopard. Liopard then uses a tract, but Iroh feels absolutely nothing inside and yawns the cat. I switch in Azula, who gets hit by a Night Slash, and that triggers Azula's flame body, which burns the Liopard and prevents her from falling asleep. Kind of annoying, but it's fine. Azula uses a single Quiver Dance and then knocks out Liopard with a Signal Beam. This Signal Beam is actually a critical hit, which, based on my calculations, is enough to knock out this Liopard five to six times over. So, good job, Azula. A bit overkill, but good job. Scrafty comes out next, but a Fire Gem boosted Flamethrower is enough for a one-shot. Azula also one-shots the Crocodile and the Bisharp in the back, and that wins us the second fight. Third is Caitlyn, who is definitely not high maintenance whatsoever. Regardless of whatever she's doing in her personal life, her psychic types are just more Azula fodder. Musharna spams Yawn a bunch, so it takes a second to get Azula in on Yawn, but once she's in safe, she sets up a single Quiver Dance, and then Signal Beam and Flamethrower sweep through Caitlyn's entire team. That's an easy third victory. The final Elite Four member is Marshall, who is a massive pain for our team. That's because every single one of his Pokemon has a Rock-type move, and one half of his Burt and Ernie Pokemon combo have the ability Sturdy, so Azula can't just sweep through the team. In order to do this, it's going to take a little bit of creativity. Marshall leads with Ernie. I lead Iroh and then use Yawn. I then switch to Azula, who's equipped with a Psychic Gem for a quick kill with Psychic. But... I forgot to teach her Psychic, which is pretty dumb, but not a huge problem. I use Quiver Dance as Ernie sleeps, and then a Flamethrower knocks him out. Out comes Conkeldur, who also goes down to a Flamethrower. Third is Burt, so it's time to switch out to Iroh and take a Rock Slide. It's a good chunk of damage, and a crit from whatever fighting type move Burt is using next will definitely kill him. So unfortunately, it's sacking time. Korra comes in on the Brick Break and takes just a little over half health. A flamethrower puts Burt in the red, and more importantly, breaks his sturdy ability. But a rock slide comes back and takes out Korra. She was only on the team for a short time, but her sacrifice will most certainly not be forgotten. Ozai comes out next and finishes off Burt with some flamethrowers. Last is Mind Chow, who has very little to hit Ozai with, but a ghost gem boosted Shadow Ball knocks it out before it even gets the chance. With that, the only thing left to do is take on the champion. Iris has a very powerful team, and she leads with a Hydreigon that knows Surf, so leading Iroh for a Yawn won't work. Instead, I have to lead Azula, who sets up with a Sunny Day to have the damage of water attacks. As a result, Surf only does a sliver. Then, I set up a Quiver Dance as Hydreigon uses Flamethrower for another chunk. At the time, I was concerned that a critical hit Flamethrower would take me out here, 
but looking back at the footage and doing the math, I don't think that it would. But because I thought it would, I don't go for a second quiver dance, and instead I go for the kill with Signal Beam. I'm hoping for Archeops to come out next, but it's Drudagon, the one Pokemon that I can't one-shot after a single quiver dance. On the flip side, Drudagon can absolutely one-shot me with a Rock Slide, so I have to switch out to Iroh, who loses a chunk to Rock Slide. But now I can hit a Yawn after Drudagon just misses with Focus Blast. Oh, I saw Focus Blast and kind of just assumed that it would miss, but no worries. Surely that won't kill Iroh. Great. Spectacular. I love this game. You know, there's a chance that Focus Blast would kill me regardless of the crit, since this is a sheer force life orb Drodagon for some reason, but I'm just going to choose to blame this on crit hacks. So yeah, this is pretty bad. The only Pokemon that can one-shot Drodagon at this point is Johnny with Outrage, but once he uses it, he's locked into Outrage for 2-3 to three turns. So depending on which Pokemon Iris sends in after that, it could be a real problem. But I don't really have another option, so I send in Johnny and one-shot the Drodagon with Outrage. Of course, after that, Agron comes out. So I'm stuck doing pitiful damage with Outrage as Agron uses Automatize and then Rock Slide. You know, this would have been a great time for Outrage to snap out after two turns instead of three turns, but of course it doesn't. With the speed boost from Automatize, Agron outspeeds everyone on my team except Darmanitan, but I can't afford to switch him in on the rock slide, so Johnny has to take the hit here for a free switch in. Mako comes in and knocks out Agron with a fighting gem boosted superpower, but now we've got to deal with Haxorus, and Mako is at minus one attack and minus one defense from superpower. So if Haxorus uses Dragon Dance here, I'm completely screwed. I am guaranteed to wipe. But I'm hoping that because Mako is at minus one defense, she'll see the kill with Earthquake and go for it. If she does, then I have to keep Mako in to take the hit and give me a free switch to someone else. So I click Fire Punch here, and fortunately Haxorus uses Earthquake, knocking out Mako and giving me a free switch into Ozai. At this point, I'm pretty sure Haxorus can one-shot with Earthquake, so I go for a Will-O-Wisp to cut its attack in half. Haxorus actually outspeeds me here, but for some reason it doesn't use Earthquake, and instead it goes for a Dragon Dance. This is Iris throwing the game. I have no idea why she does this. Earthquake most definitely one-shots, but because she's greedy, I burn the Haxorus, which lets me survive the subsequent Earthquake, and knock it out with Shadow Ball. I gotta say, relying on Will-O-Wisp with its 75% accuracy was incredibly stressful, but thankfully unlike Aaron Zhang, it worked out for me here, and I'm on to Lapras. So here we are. Iris is at two Pokemon, I'm at two Pokemon. Her Pokemon in the back is Archeops, which is faster and can one-shot both my Pokemon. So I only have one play, and it's not a guaranteed win. The first step is to unfortunately let Ozai go down and get me a safe switch into Azula. Next is a Sunny Day to have the damage of Surf. Then it's a Quiver Dance as Lapras uses Sing. Thankfully, this 55% accurate move misses, which I think makes up for the fact that Focus Blast and every single Rock Slide have hit. A flamethrower takes out Lapras, and now it's my last Pokemon against Iris's last Pokemon, an Archeops. Azula has been fully EV trained in special attack. The sun is up. She's holding a charcoal to boost the power of her fire type moves. And she has the boosts of one quiver dance. Is all of this enough to knock out the rock type Archeops? Thankfully, it is. And with that, I've beaten the champion and won the run. That was hands down the most intense final battle in a Nuzlocke I've ever had. Granted, it looks like I just made it a lot harder on myself by not going for that second quiver dance when it was really safe to do so, but it made for quite an emotional battle. Azula absolutely carried us through the Elite Four and the champion, but the sacrifices that everyone else made really can't be understated. This was by far my favorite Nuzlocke challenge yet partially due to the cool Pokemon that I got to use, but also due to the games. I think Black 2 and White 2 are truly some of the best games in the franchise. There are multiple fights that are challenging. Trainers often have coverage moves that make you think on your feet, and the move pools of each Pokemon are versatile enough to let you come up with really fun strategies to some pretty difficult challenges. I'll admit that it's frustrating that a lot of the items and the TMs require battle points, which are incredibly risky to farm in Nuzlocke's, and it's also kind of frustrating that a lot of the type resist berries that would have made this challenge easier can only be gotten using the C gear, which isn't usable on an emulator. 
But even so, these games are some of the best in the series, and they're a true Nuzlocke challenge, regardless of the rules that you set up. I can't wait to tackle this game again, but for now, we're going back to Kanto to see if we can do a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu using only Ash's Pokemon. Ash didn't evolve too many of his starting Pokemon, but in the Orange Islands, he ends up catching quite a few tanks, so we'll see how easy this challenge is. If you enjoyed watching this video, please like the video and subscribe. Or don't, I don't know. But anyways, thanks for watching, and remember to always, always, always play around the critical hit.